You know, it's crazy. Um, I guess let me start with this. Um, I don't get to take the mic a lot anymore. But when you do, I'm sure Pastor Brett can testify of this too. Man, you hear the call to nations, you know, and it's not about taking a mic, but you get to stand in front of people, you know, and you feel the hunger. And there's no time or space in the spirit, you know. So it's like you feel the hunger here, but it's like you feel the hunger somewhere in South Africa in a village. Same thing. It's no different, you know. And when you have a call of God on your life, you learn that. I mean, I did a wedding, I don't know, 10 weeks ago or something like that. And uh, <laughs> Pastor Alex was laughing, but I um, probably like 80% of the crowd was like, it was one of those weddings. You know, I had to do it. I have this lady in sales working uh, for our company. And she's like 60, probably 70. I don't even know how old she is, but she's pretty old. But um, man, she's just got a gift for like, sales so we love her dearly you know and um so i'm standing in front of all these people at the wedding and like i'm supposed to do the wedding but i probably like 150 people but man god just like wax me with the call i got in my life you know because it's been a minute since i've had the mic in my hand or preached or shared my testimony anything like that and it was like I was like, really, Lord? Like, right now? You know, like, I'm supposed to officiate this wedding, and you're wrecking me in front of everyone, you know? You can ask my wife. I am legit crying like a baby, and the wedding hasn't even started, you know? And probably everyone just thinks, like, I'm crying how beautiful the bride is, you know? <laughs> and um, I literally had to just, like, walk sideways and drink water and just be like, okay, Lord, like, you know, it's just give me a minute, you know, let me just do this wedding, you know, and uh, man, and it happens every time, like even tonight, like, you know, I just stand here and you just, you can't run away from the call of God on your life, you know, and, you know, and I know like the, the Lord will never put pressure on anyone, and, you know, they always say, the Holy Spirit will only knock so many times, you know, and if you listen, you don't, but I really believe like, and when you have a call of God on your life, the love for people are just like something crazy, you know? And, and that just comes, and you're like, man, I, I don't have that, you, you know? It will be revealed with time, you know? God's assignment and His plan for your life is a progressive thing. It's a step-by-step -step thing, you know? And we'll talk a little bit about that tonight, you know? But, man, it's, uh, it's something else. But um, pastor sends their love. Uh, obviously, they're down at Kids Week serving. Um, and then all the kids and youth over there. So um, I know there's a little confusion if we're doing tonight or not. But, I mean, in general, this is transition from a Bible study to a midweek service. So, you know, unless there's like a flood flooding the property, I think we'll have service from now on, you know. So... So just to make that clear, but um, so appreciate you guys showing up and being hungry and all that. So it won't be very long, I don't think. Um, I had like an hour heads up, so uh, I did my best to prepare. Um, but, uh, you know, I kind of knew Sunday that this was going to happen, but I was like, that's not the Lord. Don't, don't tell me that I'm not going to speak, you know, and uh, <laughs> my wife was like, you're going to. I think you're going to talk on Wednesday. I was like, no, no, that's not true. It's not going to happen. And um, there it is. So the Lord kind of warned me, but I didn't listen. So I'm sorry, Lord. Um, but I'm going to do something tonight. Um, you know, you got to be ready in season and out of season is what they say, right? Um, share my testimony. I haven't shared my testimony probably in a long time, which is bad. Uh, like, you know, the whole thing. And I probably won't share the whole thing, but I'm going to take a little time and just share it, you know, and it will help some of you, and um, got some notes written out that would go with it, you know, and uh, we'll go through it. So, let's pray. Father, thank you for this service, Lord. Thank you for this word. Lord, thank you that every ear is anointed to hear, every heart is receptive to receive what heaven wants to deliver tonight, Lord. And Father, we worship you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And it really, I mean, I would say, like, if there has to be a title or something like that, it really just comes down to your assignment, you know? 
um, assignment and the call of God, kind of a mix of the two. And, um, you know, for those that don't know, I grew up in South Africa. So born, raised in South Africa, uh, just out of Johannesburg in a small town called Benoni. Um, and, you know, as a kid growing up in South Africa, you know, it's totally different than growing up over here. You know, you hear pastor talk about that a lot. You know, just the dynamic of the country and how things are, you know. I mean, Puerto Rico is kind of similar in a way you think, like, you just grow up a little harder. You know, you just, you learn things. You have to learn certain skills in your life, you know, um, to stay safe, to know your surroundings, you know, and um, everything is not as controlled in a way, you know, and there's not a Walmart across every five minutes, you know, and a gas station on every exit, you know, you have a Lowe's and a Home Depot across from each other and a Walgreens and a CVS, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's very different, you know. I'm just saying the things that foreigners think about, you know. So um, it's like, how do you have two places right across from each other and both make money? But only in America, it's crazy. But, um, you know, but um, which I'm grateful, you know, that I was able to grow up there, you know. And I kind of knew as a young kid that, you know, there was something special in me and that there's something different, you know, you just kind of knew, you know, never really knew what it was, you know, and I grew up in a Christian household, you know, um, parents, you know, went through many different, what do you call it, like different churches, you know, like the, uh, what do you call it, Pastor Britt, like Catholic, uh, the different religions, I guess, domination, the nominations, yeah, so um, kind of like Pastor, we were in a, uh, a, um, a, a denomination that wasn't like what we are right now, Pentecostal, you know, and there was like a Pentecostal in disguise uh, in one of our kids' youth camps, you know, or probably kids' camp because I was still very young. And um, man, she, she like, just like pastors, almost like a testimony, it's like she just, she knew, she knew there was something different, you know, and put a lot of attention to me and all that. And then one camp, man, she secretly like, baptize the kids in the Holy Spirit, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's really when the Lord touched me kind of the first time, you know, and that, and from then on, I kind of knew, you know, I kind of knew like, hey, there, there's something different, you know, didn't really know what, didn't know why, you know, different things, you know, and, and growing up, I um, really loved sports, you know, sports was kind of like my life, you know, working out, doing any sport, you name it, if there was a sport, I show up and I want to do it, you know, and um, so sports was really, like, my thing, you know, and I'm sure there's some guys out here that would say the same. It's like, you know, um, that's what I lived for. And, I mean, I was more than confident in knowing that I was going to be a, a, uh, a sports star, you know. It was like, man, that is the thing that I'm going to do, you know. Me and a buddy of mine that didn't li live, too, live too far away from me, you know, and we kind of did the same sports. We were always competing, and uh, it was great. But, um, you know... You know, through the years, obviously, you know how it is whenever you become a teenager, you know, it, you, you, you do teenager things, you know, and things get a little wacko. But, um, man, I was really just hungry for the Lord. Like, in high school, we just, we uh, started a Bible study in high school. Like, um, probably like 20, 30 kids show up every Friday and uh, at one of my friend's house. He had a pretty big house. So, we did it in his living room, man, for like two years straight. That's what we did. We did a Bible study, man. We had, like, no clue about the fire of God. We had no clue about the power of God, man. All we knew was, like, we had a hunger for God, like nothing else, and we had to share it with other people, you know. And we wanted to make sure other people share this hunger, you know. And that was probably when I was 14, 15, you know. And when um, a, a preacher called Chris Oklahomey uh, from Nigeria, I don't know if anyone knows who that is, uh, he came to South Africa, and we went to see some of his services. Man, that's the first time I saw someone, like, get prayed for, fall under the power, you know. Um, you know, people getting touched, healed. You know, he has these, man, the Africans are crazy. They have these services. So he has, he has a service. Uh, it's called Atmosphere of Miracles. So at, 
people show up like at five in the morning to line up and they do it in stadiums. It's massive auditoriums. You know, this is in Johannesburg. It's called the Coca-Cola Dome. So it's like legit. It's almost like a basketball, I guess, court here, you know, where the, what's it called? The magic, you know, what are they called? Yeah. Um, people show up early, you know, and they do worship for, they start worship around nine in there and they do worship all the way till three, four o'clock. It's like, People are just hungry, man. It's just crazy. People would walk, buses, you name it, you know. And then throughout that, they will have testimonies. So he has this, this is kind of where the healing school comes from too, you know, that we do at the river. Um, they have obviously continuous healing school. So during that five, six hour worship, they'll do testimonies. So they'll have video testimonies and then they'll have interviews with people that had like crazy sicknesses or injuries or miracles, you know. And one thing about Pastor Chris's ministry, he, um, he wants people to have a doctor's certificate of what's wrong with them. He doesn't want them to just verbally say what's wrong with them. So he has people go to the doctor before healing school. They get the report. They bring the report, okay? Um, and so they go through healing school. And then by the Sunday, I think they do it Saturdays and Sundays, by the Sunday, so at the end of that worship and that testimony period, they have like people, I mean, you name it. So they have people in wheelchairs, they have like in lines. I don't know if anyone's seen anything like this. They have people in lines of wheelchairs. They have the people that are bed laden. They have them like in legit hospital beds with the IV. And um, I mean, you name it. It's like they roll them just out of the hospital, out of an ambulance and have them all lined up. Then they have a room that's closed off that people that have diseases that can, um, what's the English word, that can like quarantine infectious diseases, you know, like crazy stuff. Um, so they have that, so they have that like digged up. So I knew a friend that um, knew someone that served them. I don't know if you guys know Pastor PJ and DNA for fear from, they did, they started a healing school in Tampa Bay. So they're back to South Africa, they started a church. But so at that, that time they were working for him. So that's how we got in. Um, so we're like in the second row, something like that. So, man, he starts praying for these people, you know, and people are just getting healed. And it's like crazy Africanness. People are running and dancing. You just see wheelchairs flying and canes flying. And, you know, and then, I mean, I'm like curious this whole time, like about this room, you know, because I heard about this room. So he gets to this room and basically his armor bear takes the camera and just him and his armor bear goes in. No gloves, no mask, no nothing, you know? And he goes and lays his hands on these people. There was this one guy, I'll never forget it, you know? It's almost like a, it looks like a, um, what do you call it? Like a, a dishwashing sponge, the yellow ones, you know, the yellow with the green? So his skin looked like a dishwashing sponge, like the yellow, and it was yellow too, you know? So sorry to gross you out, but that's what his whole leg looked like. Bro, this preacher takes his hand and he puts his hand right on it, dude. It's like almost like I don't know if you guys ever heard of John G. Lake, you know, when uh, I think it was TB, uh, the sickness broke out, you know, and they had it under the microscope and he said, put it on my hand. And when they put it in his hand, the sickness died and they looked under the microscope and the sickness was dead, you know. So it's, it's, a, it's a faith level to admire, you know, and it's available to us, you know. And man, I was just like, I was stunned, you know, as a kid, like, had this hunger for the Lord in me, obviously, you know, but, and these services have been happening minutes from my house and never knew, you know, never knew. And we knew, like, there was something that we were missing, you know, I had this friend with me that was, you know, we were kind of pressing in, kind of like Pastor Alex and Pastor Brett, like, pressing in together, know that there's something higher, you know, like, there's something more to just reading the Bible. Not that there's Bible's reading is very, very important, but there's the power of God that goes with it, you know? And growing up 14 years old, 15 years old, whatever I was at the time, and still like knowing like, man, and the sad part to think about it is, is that, you know, my parents didn't know, you know? And they were what, in their 40s at that time, I guess, you know? And it's like no one ever showed him or, you know, like reveal that to him, whatever the reason may be, you know, to think like there's people out there, you know, that are truly hungry for God, that truly love God, that truly, you know, are reading the Word, but they just, they don't know that, that there's so much more available for them, you know, and um, 
So obviously that just changed my life. You know, the Bible talks about scales falling off their eyes. I've seen the scales. I've, the guy's eyes was totally white, and he prayed for him, and stuff fell in his hand. You know, it's just like creative, crazy miracles. You know, so and they will do that till 8 p.m. at night. It's like it's long church. You know, like you uh, you're quite tired when you get out of there. You know what I'm saying? But you're so fired up and hungry, and knowing what's possible. You know, and um, and so that service was really like the miracle service that we, you know, still didn't really know like about the fire of God and the anointing and all that stuff, you know. And, um, but man, I was like, man, I want that, you know, like that is amazing, you know. Um, and, you know, out of that, Pastor Rodney did the 50 Days of Glory. Has anyone heard of the 50 Days of Glory that he did in South Africa? Yeah, so he went for two weeks. Um, and PE, South Africa, Pastor Andre's church, and basically, like, I mean, just revival broke out, the fire broke out. I mean, souls were just coming in like crazy, and they extended to 50 days, you know, uh, which is basically like two months of services, and, um, and man, it was cold. It was really cold, and the church had, like, windows broken in the top, so wind was coming through. If you go watch the replay, you see people like in five blankets sitting there, you know. And, and one thing about South Africa that you got to know is, is that you have, you have super rich, you have very little middle class, and you have poor. And you have poor, poor. So it's like Pastor said Sunday, it's not like American poor. It's like where people literally build their houses. They find a piece of land. They don't own it. So they'll find a piece of land. They'll claim it. And they'll basically shack up. They'll find road signs. They'll find pieces of steel, you know, metal. And they'll build their house out of that, you know. And a lot of times their flooring is tarps or bricks, you know. that you know, Or they have this way where they take uh, clay and cow manure and stuff. And they make this special type of cement. And that's what they do on their floors. And they would polish it like red. I mean, they do it pretty nice. But... Um, but, and then obviously the tribes do it different. The tribes obviously have their tribal houses. They do it a little better, the crazy part. But, like, around the cities and stuff, like, it's bad, you know. Um, obviously they, they have fire going all the time, you know. So, and, you know, these were the type of people that would show up. These are the type of people that are hungry, you know. And, and, and that's why I admire pastors so much, man. These are the people that they focused on when they were there. These are the people that they raised up, you know. And these are the people today that are on television, that are lawyers and doctors, you know. And then and, and so much more, you know. And that really inspired me because a lot of people come to these services and miracles happen. But, like, people don't take the time to raise them up, you know, to raise them out of their captivity, to raise them out of their situations, you know. And that's why I'm really excited to go back with Pastor, you know. I mean, he speaks the vision of our church going into the nations, you know. And a lot of us will go with, you know. And this will all be a part of that, raising up the Bible schools, you know, and, and doing that, you know. And that's such a great, great way to do it. But, um, but out of that, you know, that's where I kind of saw on TV. I wasn't there physically. Um, I couldn't go. I was playing rugby, you know, but... That's where I kind of saw the fire of God and the anointing of God move, you know. And I didn't, like, think much about it at that point. I was a little distracted, you know. Um, but, man, I, I just saw that and be like, man, that, that is, that's crazy and that's amazing, you know. And right after 50 days, um, Pastor Rodney came close to my house at a church right there. And this, I think I was 16 at this point, you know. And he did a service and we went. And... Um, you know, obviously, if you've been to a Pastor Rodney service, you, I don't even have to explain how it went, you know. But I'm sure everyone here had their first experience, have never seen it, you know. Um, and that's kind of what it was for me, you know. And one of my friends really got touched. Uh, Pastor Brett would know her, Zante, um, you know, got really touched in that service. And Pastor Rodney gave her a scholarship, you know, and be like, hey, I'm going to give you a scholarship. What are you doing when you turn 18, you know? And uh, she knew she had a call of God in her life. Her parents on the ministry. And uh, and I was like, great, she's going to go to America. That's awesome for her, you know? And um, and obviously, man, this really stirred up a hunger in me, you know? Like at that point, man, this is a game changer. Like this is it. This is what we've been looking for, you know? And, you know, on the side, you know, all of this, you know, I was focused on rugby. There was 
I was going to be a rugby star. I don't care. High or low water, that's what I'm going to do with my life. You know, like, I'm going to do it. You know, and, and, and another friend of mine, Ron Nell, he's professional now. Um, you can look him up. You know, he's a professional rugby player. He plays for our country and all that. We were, like, dedicated. I mean, this is what we're going to do. And we just knew we could do it, you know. And, um, man, and so, like, I, on one side, I wanted the Lord, man. I wanted the call of God. I knew, like, I mean, I could hear... I knew a slightest day that I was called by God. You know, there was different things that happened in my life. Um, you know, I was dating a girl for like, <laughs> I almost said a bad word, for like nine years, you know. Um, believe it or not, since like I was in grade two and I dated her up until I was like 17 or something. Super confident as my wife. And, uh, you know, and she ended up leaving me for some pop star dude. But that really wrecked my life. And the crazy part is, man, that happened at the same time as I was experiencing all these things, you know, like when in bad depression, you know, lost a bunch of weight, you know, and it's like, man, how can this happen to me? Like, you know, I'm, you know, how you, I mean, young love, you know, I mean, I'm sure some of you have experienced it or have got broken by it, you know, so hopefully you haven't. But um, you just don't know what you don't know. You know, I kind of wish like life was Benjamin Button. Anyone? Anyone wish life was like Benjamin Button, you know, <laughs> kind of going backwards? Um, yeah, right? So it kind of just talk to your young self, like, it's okay, man. You're only 16. There's so much more to live for, you know, just enjoy your life, you know. But, um, I mean, it's, uh, but it's only you, myself, and the world, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's all you care about. But so, you know, through some counseling and all that, because it was bad, and my, my mom said, you know, she would open up the door in the mornings in my room and wondering if I'm, you know, still alive some mornings, you know, I was just acting so bad. But, um, you know, the Lord sent a lady that really, really ministered to me and, man, really, like, brought the word to me. And, I mean, God brought me through, you know, and that's a whole long story I won't get into. But, man, that's when I knew and, you know, I could hear the call of God, you know, and that's when I could really start hearing the nations and I could really, like, see myself, you know, I could see myself preaching in front of people. I could see myself preaching in front of thousands, you know. And um, so I knew that I knew if there was something that I knew, even though I wanted to be this rugby star, I knew, man, that God has a call on my life, you know, and I can't run away from it no matter what. How it's going to happen, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know, you know, when you're still a teenager, what do you know, you know, and um, man, so life goes on from that point and you're like, man, you're telling a long story. Don't worry, I'm getting to a place. Um, if I'm boring you, I'm sorry. But um, I go to college, and, you know, obviously everything changes. You know, I don't know if anyone's been in college here. Anyone been in college? Been in college? Yeah. So I stayed in a, you know, uh, what do they call it in English? Like a, a dormitory. There we go. So, you know, and you obviously you know how that goes, you know. So, But super just focused on rugby, you know. Like, if you know me closely, if you've ever seen my sports jacket, I was a size 42. 42 jacket. I'm a 38 now, so I was way bigger than what I am right now. I've lost a lot of weight uh, since I've come to America, but I'm picking it back up right now. Um, so, uh, you know, so just super focused in that, you know. Unfortunately, started using light steroids because they were, like, telling me, like, hey, if you want to keep your position in college, you have to pick up a certain amount of weight in six months. We don't care how you do it. You just got to do it. You know, funny story. So I got to pick up, what was it, 20 pounds. So it was 10, 10 K. So I don't know if someone do the math, but, um, in six months. And like, I mean, I tried everything for the gym guys here, tried creatine, Dyna balls. I mean, you, you name it, muscle fuel, all the different stuff, you know? And, uh, I had a buddy and he's like, man, he, you want the stuff? I know the guy, you know, it's like, well, if you think it's good for us, let's do it. You know? And, uh, he takes me to this one dormitory and we knock on the door and it's my, um, my professor that was teaching us um, math, I think it was at that time, I can't remember what he was teaching us, but man, he is, he is as skinny as a rod, you know what I'm saying? And he's here the one selling the steroids, you know, so, and, and the bottle said equine only, you know, so it was horse steroids, but, so we would mix it with B12, you know, and we will put it in places I won't mention, so, um, you know, and we did that, and, and it worked, you know, um, but, um, sorry, that was a side story that had no context to it at all. But um, um, I just think it's always funny. The skinniest guy and my professor is the one selling it. Why doesn't he use it himself? But um, anyway, so at this point, man, I am there. I'm alone. And the, 
call of God is on my life, and I hear it. I hear it at night when I go to bed. I hear it at morning when I wake up. You know, and at that point, you know, obviously your friends around you are doing crazy stuff, man. And, and at that point, I'm really seeking God, you know. And, and, I, and, I, and I just had to keep it true, you know. And I was really struggling, man. It was a fight on the inside of me. Like, Lord, I'm going this way. I can see myself getting there. Just as I saw myself serving God, fulfilling the call of God in my life, I could see the left side as much as me running on a sport field, playing for my country, you know, playing for my, you guys call it state here, for my province, you know, and living that type of life, you know, and, and both look good, you know. Both looked amazing, I'll have money, I'll be happy, you know, I'll have the girl that I wanted, you know, thinking my girl will come back to me when I'm that guy, you know, still not over her that much, you know. Um, and just trying to be live like these two worlds, you know. And the one, obviously, is very lonely because in my sports life, there wasn't really much people there, you know. And then obviously, in my godly call of God side, like I had people on that side, you know, this whole time. And one of them was that, that girl, Zante, you know. Um, so it's like, you know, man, which way do you go? And there was a, an evangelist um, came to uh, South Africa called Saudi. And those of you that know Saudi, Saudi Pekarol, he just went back to South Africa. And he came and did some meetings. And uh, it was my summer break. And this was like June. And he needed someone to drive him around. And I was like, well, I'll do it, you know, like, you know, Zonta asked me if I could do it. I was like, yeah, I didn't know what I was getting myself into, you know. Um, and he would go to schools, man. And I tell you, like, this guy, if you know him, you don't know him. Let me just say that. You know, in South Africa, it's like, it's not like people, it's so wrong to say this. It's not people worship him, but people just love him, man. It's like, I think there's a place, like, whenever you're in the place you're supposed to be, you know, the grace is, like, so sufficient. You know, I've talked about this a lot in our leaders' meetings, you know, like our, our core leaders' meeting. Like, there's a grace for everything that you do, you know. God's graced you for everything. Graced you to be a wife, graced you to be a husband, to be a sister, a brother, to be a salesman, a businessman. Like, there is a grace. And I'll talk about here in a second, like, how I came to find that out, you know. But, but man, he has a grace over there. And he would go to the schools preach, and the schools are open there. You could go there right now, and you can walk up to the principal and be like, hey, I'm Caleb from America. Uh, I have something to share with your kids. It's about Jesus. I want to help you. Okay, cool. You want to go right now? You want to call them in? That's how it is. Like, that's how it is. Like, it's so open, you know? And, uh, you know, I hope we'll get to do it uh, when we go, which I know we will. But, um, and that's basically what we did. So, obviously, I had a little bit of influence at some of the schools because people obviously knew me, you know? Um, so I would take them to the schools, and I would just get them in the office, and, you know, we'll just do it. And uh, over there, we have, like, big holes that they build, you know, like big, is it a hall? Is that what they call it? Or like a, almost like a sanctuary, where they, you have your attendance every Monday. They'll do a worship, and a preacher will come and preach every Monday, and the schools do it over there. They really still fear God, you know. But um, Anyway, so, like, they'll just put it on the intercom and in all the classes and the kids will just come and they'll line up, you know, and the, they'll sit down and you have free reign as long as you want to, you know. So he would have a full revival service in school. So obviously God knows what he was doing, you know. And um, we did that probably for about two weeks. And he did some services. And like, we'll be in services. So in between that, that same pastor, Chris Oklahoma, did a service. And I'll, I'll, I'll speed up the story here. Um, he did an a anointing service where it was all pastors and leaders and in the same stadium, like, I mean, like, packed, like, the whole top row. I mean, it, it's a dome, so you can just imagine, I think, 30, 40,000 people, every seat. I mean, it goes all the way up, all the way on the ground, everything, you know. And uh, he starts praying for people, and <laughs> over there, they have these plastic garden chairs. I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about. And they, they take... Um, uh, what do you call those things? Um, zip ties. They zip tie them together because when he prays for people, obviously the chairs fly and all that, and they don't have time to like fix the rows. They just pick up the whole row and the whole row just picks up, you know. But when he prays for people, you see like a plastic feet hits the air, chairs break, you know, you just hear them snap, you know. So, uh, you know, we're like in the third row and he like 
has everyone stand up. Now, I have not felt the power of God. I have never fall down, if, you know, if that's a thing for you. Like, and it's not about falling down, but I've just never felt that. You know, obviously I felt the presence of God and things like that, but just never had that, you know. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so anyways, obviously he prays over the whole, the whole crowd. You know, and I have that same, that same girl with me. Um, Zante was my friend. And, um, and guess who's the only two standing? We are. And, uh, yeah, sorry, plot of the story. I didn't fall over. Um, most powerful preacher in Africa. Um, and he, like, looks at us. And he's like, don't quench the Holy Spirit. And, like, points at us, you know. And, like, your legs are, like, shaking at that point, you know. And um, I didn't even know what that meant. Like, don't quench the Holy Spirit. What does quench mean? Is that, like, a kish or something that I got to eat, you know. Like, didn't even know. Because I was in English, you know. So, you know, my real language is Afrikaans. So that's why I'm sometimes struggling to get a word up here. So it's not because I'm just less like, I'm dys dyslexic. There's an example right there. It's just English is not my first language. But um, so, like, I had to, like, man, and I'm kind of a thinker in my head too much, if you know me. And that's why they probably hired me as the administrator. So I'm a lot in my head sometimes, you know, and that's probably one of the things. You can't be in your head with the Holy Spirit and with the Lord, you know. You need your head to process things, but you really got to receive with your heart and your spirit, right? And I didn't know that. No one taught me that, you know. And a lot of times I was a kid to receive better, but obviously I was a teenager in my head, you know. Um, trying to figure out what is happening, why are people falling over, you know. I'm sure some of you have thought maybe the same thoughts, you know. So, um, And he, like, called these people up on the very back, the youth pastors were, like, just imagine you're on a dome and, like, the very top row on the very back. I mean, you're talking about, I don't know, 100 yards, 150 yards maybe. Because, like, as it feels like 100 yards, maybe 125, whatever it is. Um, see, I'm trying to figure out the number, sorry. Um, and he tells them to stand up, man, and he prays for them, and they all just fall over, you know. And I'm just like, what? How? How? Like, what is happening, you know, like how, are, he's not even touching them, just couldn't understand, you know, and right after that, Pastor Rodney had another meeting in PE, obviously this is a few years later from the last one, same location, it was the seven days of glory is what it was called, and Saudi hands me an iPod just before it, and um, if you've ever heard the song, The Sweet Presence of Jesus, who's heard The Sweet Presence of Jesus, the song from Pastor Joan Becky Cruz that was just here? If you haven't heard it, don't listen to it in the car. Like I said, go listen to it. it is, man, it is a wrecker. Like, it is a wrecker, you know? And then he had, like, Bible school teachings on there and stuff like that. And uh, so it's still my summer break. So right before that, man, I am, like, on that iPod nonstop, just hungry for God. We had, like, a pool table. I, was, I, was saying, like, I don't know why I was laying under the pool table, but I was. But I was laying under the pool table, earphones in. Man, just listening, listening to pastor preaching, you know, uh, in Bible school, probably in the school Pastor Bread was at that time, you know, thinking like, man, how does the school look? What is pastor doing right now? But just hanging on every word he was saying, you know, like so unfamiliar with what he was saying, you know, and like I've always asked the Lord, like, let me never lose this. A lot of times we can come sit in the service and you're like, man, I've heard that before. Oh, I've heard that, especially if you've been around for a while, you know, like, been, been there, you know, like, I've been on so many revival meetings, I can't even tell you, you know, but it's like, man, that's always stick to my heart, it's like, God, let me never be, let me take me back to that first time when I heard Pastor Rodney preach, you know, under the pool table, it's like, every word he was saying, like, oh, okay, he's saying doing that, okay, he's saying doing that, you know, like, and then that song obviously would play, and I would just be a, a wrecker, you know, goes to the service with Saudi pastor never laid hands on me. I wanted so bad for him to lay hands on me, you know, because that's in my head is how I thought it was going to happen, how the Lord was going to touch me, like Pastor Rodney was going to pray for me. The very last service, he was ministering to people, and they were playing a song, Pastor Joan Becky, and then God just wrecks me, you know, just absolutely wrecks me, like never before. Like it was tears, not all the above, you know, just running. And, um, Man, that was a changing point in my life, you know. I didn't care about anything. I didn't care about sports anymore. I didn't care about rugby. I didn't care about nothing. I didn't care about my studies. 
like all I wanted to do was God be the man that you've made me to be like be on the assignment you have for me you know that's all that matters you know that's all I wanted and I was just so hungry so hungry for that you know and um my godfather had a farm growing up so I spent a lot of time on cow farms um whenever I had spare time man I'm on the farm and right after that man I go to the farm and we have like this mountain on the farm and and I'm just spending time with the Lord you know and uh you know always you see these pictures of people on the farm I mean on the mountain just worshiping the Lord you know I wanted to be that guy so um and uh God God speaks to me like voice like I hear it I want you to go to America and I was like, okay, what do you want me to do there? No answer. I was like, okay, I just, I just heard someone. I mean, the only one probably in like hundreds of miles, maybe the farm help, but he can't speak Afrikaans, so that's not him talking to me, you know, so there's no people in miles, you know. Um, and I just knew right away in my spirit after I asked that question that, I knew about Zante in the school, you know, that she was gone. I knew that's where I needed to go. I just knew. I just know that I knew that I knew, like, that's what needed to happen, you know. And um, so, oh, the rock kids are dismissed. If you have kids. Um, you don't drive home in South Africa at nighttime. You don't really drive at night in general. But I got in the truck, and I drove home. My parents were already in bed, and I went in, and I said, I'm going to America. I'm going to go to Bible school. That's what I'm going to do. And, you know, obviously, if your kid walks in maybe at 11 at night, you know, what did you drink? You know, what's wrong with you? You know? Um, they ended up, long story short, they took me to my pastor because um, I was building a relationship with my pastor at that time. And uh, he didn't say anything when we walked in. And my parents tell them the whole spiel and, like, how crazy I am and how they want me to finish my studies first, because obviously now I'm six, seven months into my studies, finish it, and then I can go do whatever I want to do, you know, because obviously they've invested money, I mean, you know, you can understand, you know, into my contract for my housing and all that stuff, and, um, and he was like, well, when I saw your son walk down the aisle, God said that my hand is with him wherever he's going, wherever I'm sending him. And uh, my parents looked at him, my dad said legit out loud, that's not why I brought him here. I brought him here for you to talk him out of it, you know. And he was like, well, that's what, that's what he's got to do, you know. And um, man, and not like much after that, a pastor asked me to come and preach at their youth. And, you know, long story short, preach at their youth. My parents shows up, my parents are in there. Never preached in my life, but I was so hungry. I've obviously listened to a ton of teachings from Pastor Rodney preaches and God speaks to my mom and my parents say that I've called them to the nations and you got to let them go. So obviously they made peace, cried and all the above. All right, came to America. Well, this thing is speeding up. Um, obviously came to Bible school. Uh, man, just hungry for God, you know. Uh, and I'll just back up a second, you know, like the reason why I told that whole story is like, man, I had these two paths in front of me, you know, that looked very clear, that looked very possible. I mean, I probably could have chose the other path. Who knows how it would have worked out, you know? It worked out for my friend, and I'm super happy for him, you know? And I believe that's what he should be doing, you know? But I do believe God would have still loved me, you know? He obviously would have still went with me, but it would not have been what God really had for me, you know? And I'm so glad I picked the other one, you know? And I have a tendency of making like crazy decisions last minute and I'm glad that God put that on the inside of me, you know, because I just knew that I knew. I mean, you know, leaving college, telling my parents I'm done, selling everything in my dorm, you know, selling my car, you know, and got the last plane ticket next to my friend that ended up going, you know, passport came in supernaturally within a month because this was July, school started in August. So it was a quick transition that I had to get in America, you know, but it all worked out. Um, man, obviously came to Bible school and I, I could just say like God supernaturally supplied everything, you know, housing just was amazing families that took me in, in the beginning, you know, that kind of helped. I stayed with some families, you know, obviously getting used to the way of the Americas, you know, and you know, how things work around here, uh, 
you know, never, never needed anything the whole time I was here, you know. And um, really, like, my first year, I saw this guy serving pastor, uh, Brian Fetzner. And I was like, man, that's what I'm going to do. Well, I, you know, I knew, but I asked the Lord, Lord, if you want me to do that, I want to do that, you know. He was, you know, pastor's right hand serving him. And I just knew, you know, it's kind of like I said, I knew Sunday I was going to talk tonight, but, you know, I didn't think it was the Lord. But, um, but I just knew, like, that's what I'm going to do. I don't know how. First year, haven't spoken a word to pastor, haven't shaken his hand once, but I knew that I was going to serve him, you know, that was going to be me. And, um, man, I was just faithful, you know, obviously pastor preaches about all that stuff here, you know, just being faithful in the ministry. If someone needs to show up to serve, I serve, you know. My ministry of helps was uh, landscaping, you know. I was the one weed eating and cutting the grass at the river, you know, man, and I did it. God was watching me like I was doing it for heaven. You know, if I weeded it a circle around a tree, man, I made sure that thing was a circle, you know. If I had to edge, you know, I edged that thing, you know, like perfectly like an army haircut, you know, like uh, I don't know what they call those haircuts, you know. Um, I just didn't let anything slide, you know. We had this class on stewardship my first year that really, really changed my life, you know, because I connect, I have like a little OCD of me, where everything has to be perfect in a way, you know, like if you go to my, thank God, thank God he made my wife that way, because otherwise that would have been fun in our marriage, you know, but um, if you go look at my closet, everything is color coordinated, you know, all the socks are folded a real way, you know, but I'm not like that bad, but you know, that's just the way I am, like my desk, everything is lined up, you know, so it's, it's bad, it's bad. But I'm not like in cleanliness that, well, well, I'm in clean, but I'm not like, you know, how some people wipe everything down. That, that's not me, you know. But like I just like things to be in order and things to be great. Because in my heart, you know, everything that I do, I do unto the Lord. You know, I mean, that's what the Bible says, you know, everything. I don't take anything lightly, you know. And that really changed my life. Because it was like almost like you had this light bulb in you, but you just needed the power to turn it on, right. And so I had this light bulb that I knew God put on the inside of me. And my mom knew that I was that way, and I think she's a little that way, but it's like I just never just connected with the heavenly purpose, you know? So it's a lot of times, like, you have something, and it's like, man, I have this, but you need a heavenly purpose jolt, you know, that fire, that power to just get with it, and you know, like, okay, this is why I am this way, you know? Um, and so, you know, just serving my first year, showing up, you know, and um, everything that I did, like I said, from cutting lawn, from ushering, from catching excellence, man. Showing up, you know, if I ever dropped someone as an usher, I was super hard on myself, you know, like, why did I make that mistake? How can I do it better? It's like legit, I went back and asked Pastor David for retraining, what did I do wrong, you know, just, man, I just, I just had a heart for excellence, you know, it's like, because I knew what I gave up to be there, you know, like, no one in my family has ever traveled. I mean, my dad was in the military. He traveled within Africa, but no one ever got on a plane and, like, left country, you know? No one went to university. I was the first one in my family that went to university, you know? So it's like, man, I just, I just knew what I left, you know, and I just, I'm just going to make everything of it, you know? I'm not going to leave anything behind, you know? And they had me started serving pastor, all my bearing and stuff like that, you know? And obviously... Man, you had a strap. You had a strap when Pastor Rodney would walk in. Back in the day, they had like these. Who remember the river? Do they, they still have the river straps. You know those straps that they use to like let people. So they had it. <clears throat> they had like four of them. It was a little different at that point. The stage was way different. So Pastor would come down the elevator and they'll have a strap because there was no like stage entrance at that point. He had to come from the front. I don't know, Pastor Bet, you remember that strap that he would come by? So they assigned me on that strap before I was an alma bear. Man, like, I took that so serious. Dude, like, I would, like, stand here, like, watch that elevator. I don't care who was talking to me. I, I'm not missing this strap for Pastor Rodney, you know what I'm saying? Like, this strap's going to be on time. It's going to be on time, you know? And, um, you know, I just, I just wanted to do everything perfect for the Lord. I was never about man, never about him. I just, man, I wanted to make him proud, you know? I wanted to make the Lord proud and be like, man, I... I take serious the call that you have in my life, and no matter what it is, you know. And at that time, you don't even have all these teachings that we are so privileged to have that pastor gives us and all that stuff, you know. And, you know, and I believe the Lord honored that and rewarded me in that to serve the man of God, you know. And end up 
serving Pastor Rodney for four years, you know, um, traveling with him around the world, you know, uh, running his whole house and his staff, you know, and his uh, ranch operation that he has up there, you know, and, and just being close to him, you know, and um, what an honor it was, you know, and seeing the the things behind ministry, you know, and how, how all that operates and all that, you know, being in all the meetings, seeing people get touched and lifting up their hands and all that, you know, and, you know, it, it was a great, great honor, you know, and there's so many stories that I could tell of that, but I'm not going to do that for the sake of time, you know. Um, you know, from there on, obviously, I met my wife, you know, had her come work for me at the manor. Uh, to make sure that we can work together in ministry, and uh, she did great. Um, man, my wife is awesome. The Lord has done such a great work in her heart, you know, and prepared her. And, uh, yeah, I mean, from there on, you know, uh, I'll kind of stop there, I think. You know, I mean, I think most people know from there on, you know. Um, we left for South Africa. We are going to start a church at that point, but I had some paperwork issues. <clears throat> this was right before covid didn't work out. I had to come back. COVID hits. We end up being here. And, uh, you know, we haven't left. And Father God call us to come lift up the hands of Pastor Alex and Lauren, you know. And, you know, have no ambition to start a church or anything like that just to serve them, you know. And, uh, man, what a road it's been. And obviously, I went really cooked through the story, you know, for the sake of time. But, um, Man, it was just all about, like, God, what is my assignment, you know? And one thing that I've learned, man, is that your, your assignment's a puzzle. You know, it gets revealed piece by piece. God's not just going to show you the whole picture like the puzzles do, you know? He shows you, like, hey, I've called you to do this and that, you know? Like, I've called you to preach to the nations and whatever it is, but he doesn't give you, like, the clear detail of the puzzle, you know? It's like some people just want to have like a McDonald's, you know, like, hey, one visit with God, I get my whole assignment, and then I'm out, you know, and that's, that's not how it works, you know, it's continuous exchange with him, you know, right through the story, like, you know, like, it was continuous exchange, continuous hunger, different levels that I had to go through to where I'm at today, you know, if you read in Isaiah, just so I can say I read a scripture tonight, 2813, he says, but the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Isaiah 28, 13, you know? So each day produces new clues to your assignment. That's why it's so important that each day we spend time with the Lord. Each day we kindle that hunger. Each day we don't get used to the presence of God. Just like that first time when you got saved, man, your hunger you had for the Word, the hunger you had for His presence, you know? And, you know, I was guilty. I mean, obviously... There's a lot of times in my life where I was like, man, life is good. I'm not as hungry, or whatever it is, you know, and a lot of times then life hits and you're like, oh, man, I got to get back to God and see what's going on, you know. And, uh, man, I've really challenged myself this year not to be that way, you know, and it, it, it's, it's been great. Um, you know, it kind of happened with Philip, you know, with Philip, you know, in Acts 8, you'll see like, you know, the Lord revealed it to him piece by piece. You know, the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, Arise, go toward the south, under the way that goes down Jerusalem, out of Gaza, which is the desert. So he went, you know, he arrived. And if you know the story, he saw a eunuch at the, in the chariot, you know, and the Egyptian, you know, um, was actually reading of the word. You know, and then another instruction came after that. And then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and join thyself to the chariot, right? So he had to get there, he got there, and then the Lord told him to join it, you know? And then what happened after that? He baptized him, you know? So, so there's like progressive, you know, Pastor Peaches, a lot about this, like your assignment, your treasure, your field, you know? And it, it's puzzle by puzzle, you know? Um, you know, it's like, for me, you know, like a lot of times in we, we want God to give us a total photograph of the journey, you know, the conclusion, you know, some people fast for it, you know, pray for it, you know, like, God, I want direction, you know, like really suffering here, eating no food, like what have you called me to do, you know, you pursue people, maybe mentors and stuff like that, and it's still not there, but, you know, it's one day at a time. It takes an hourly dependency upon the Holy Spirit. 
you know, you have to develop that relationship with the Lord that he deserves between us and him. It comes out of a relationship, right? The intimate things, when you think about a relationship, like, hey, let's take Cody, for instance, right? Just met Cody. Am I going to share intimate stuff with Cody, like, right away on our first handshake? But if I start seeing Cody every day, maybe work with him, maybe we talk, build a relationship, what's getting built? Trust, right? Then I start sharing some intimate things with him, like, you know, things that are a little bit deeper, you know? And that's how it is with the Lord. It's like he's just not going to, well, I got saved today. I'm called to God. All right, tomorrow he's going to give me my whole thing. I got to go to, you know, to Nigeria and preach the gospel, go open up a church here and do that. And that's not how that works, you know? It's, it's, it's a walk. It's a puzzle by puzzle. It's an hourly dependency, you know? Like it happened to Moses, right? If you go all through chapter 7 and 10, we won't do that right now. Like, man, he understood that principle, right? And even it got discouraging at times for Moses, you know, like, and he saw some crazy things, you know, he watched the plagues, you know, um, you know, all those things. But he went through collecting a whole collection of seasons with his walk through God, you know. And it's almost like, and even with him, if you look at it, like every, no matter how small the instruction is, it has purpose, you know. So, you know, like we don't always understand that I would say. We, you know, we may wish and pray, but I mean, it's just increasing your faith step by step is what it comes down to. You know, a good example that I was thinking about is like lifting weights, you know. So, let's say you have a trainer and I go and I know nothing, right? Let's just say John and Cody, they're, 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 they're the trainers here. Like, I'm just going like, hey, guys, I need you to train me. I, you know, I want to get to this amount of mass, I want to start with 200 pounds bench press today. And Cody and John's like, no, nah, man, let's just start with 50. I'm like, no, man, I want to start with 200, you know. I'm like, okay, man, let's do it, you know. Uh, take the 200 pounds and I go for it, right. You know, what's most likely going to happen if I haven't worked out? I'm going to do maybe one and choke myself to death or maybe two or three, depending, you know. And uh, I'm going to quit, you know, I'm going to be discouraged you know, I'm going to not want to do this anymore. This training thing is dumb, you know, and uh, it's going to cause stress, like all that, you know. But so that's how it kind of is, you know. It's like, it's like, man, that's how the Lord won't reveal everything to you at one point because it's not the weight. You, you got you to gotta work out. They talk about the muscle of faith, right? You got to work out your muscle of faith. You know, if God told me like, when I was eight years old, like, hey, I want you to go to America and do this and this and this. You're going to marry a Puerto Rican and this is what you got to do and this is going to be your fault. You know, make sure you don't do this. Like, I mean, it won't work, right? It would be just too much to handle. We just got to trust. We just got to trust the Lord. We got to make sure we're doing our part. We got to make sure that we show up every day having relationship with him, building that puzzle with him, you know, piece by piece. As he reveals it, we, we put it in place, you know, and like, a puzzle gets stronger the more pieces that it has in it, right? My wife loves puzzles. That's what we do. I'm getting her to do Lego. That's my puzzle thing, you know? So the Lego, uh, if you haven't built Lego with your wife, that's a good date thing right there. You'll thank me later. Um, so, but, like, that's piece by piece, you know? Um, and that's how it works. So, but if I do what they told me, like, hey, let's start at 50. Let's do 12 12, uh, 12 reps, three sets, you know what I'm saying? Like, let's start there. What is that going to do? That's going to make me feel good. I'm going to feel good. My T-shirt's going to be tight, you know what I'm saying? Like, man, this is awesome, you know? And the next time I'm going to show up, you know, okay, let's do 60, you know? Like, let's, it's going to build my faith every day, and I'm going to enjoy what I'm doing, right? And that, that's the same way it is. Like, it builds your confidence. It builds your expectation, you know? Wisdom, you know, I'll wrap up kind of with this. Like, wisdom is the key, you know? You can... You can go anywhere you want to go if you're willing to take small steps, you know. Instructions are seasonal. So that's why it's important to take the steps with the Lord, you know. You might not get instructions every day or every week, but you go by the last instruction that you received, right? In Numbers 14:14 14, 14, it says, Thy cloud standeth over them, and thy ghost before them. Thy day and a pillar of a pillar of a cloud and my pillar of fire by night, right? Perf perfect, perfect example. You know, it guided them every day afresh. And that's how it should be for us, you know? 
So I would say each morning, man, requires a fresh pursuit, you know. You know, only on the sixth day. Sorry, my note makes no sense that I put here. We'll skip that one. Oh, um, so the receiving instructions from the Holy Spirit reminds me much of gathering the manna, with the manna of the Israelites, right? That's what it meant. So each morning required a fresh pursuit because God only gave him manna enough for each day, right? He only gave him enough bread for each day, right? What does that translate to? That translates to the word. That's right to instruction today, right? Um, so like each morning they had to get up and they had to follow God afresh. You know, they couldn't get up and be like, oh, there's the cloud. I'm going to do my own way today, like, you know. I'm not going to do the cloud today. You know, they had to go by the cloud every day. And what's any different today? What's like, what's like our vision of, you know, our, uh, our symbol of the cloud today? It's the Holy Spirit, right? It's the Holy Spirit. It's our cloud by the day and fire by night, you know, guiding us each step of the way, guiding us in each meeting that we go into with our business, guiding us in each conversation we go into, every phone call, you know, it's the same thing, you know? And like they stayed in a continuous, you know, we have to stay in a continuous attitude of thanksgiving, you know? Total, total addiction, addiction to his presence, to his awareness of how important he is, you know. I, I really make a point now where I make time to get in the secret place with the Lord for fresh instructions for every day. I may not receive them every day. I might come out of there like, didn't get instruction for the day and that's okay, you know. But I, I knew his presence is with me, you know. And some mornings you kind of know, you know. Like I said, like Sunday I knew I was going to talk tonight, you know, even though I didn't want to listen but I knew, you know, there's just some things that you will know, you know. And I think a lot of us know when the Holy Spirit speaks, you know. Um, what you do first determines what God will do second. You know, when I complete his instruction, I become qualified for his second instruction. Miles Monroe said that. I think it was great. What you do first determines what God will do second. When I complete his first instruction... I become qualified for a second instruction. You know, the Bible says that, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Keep listening to his voice. The Holy Spirit is talking to you. For those that have ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. When you turn on the right hand or to the left, I'll leave you with this, and then we'll pray. You will never progress beyond your last point of disobedience. I'll say that again. You will never progress behind your last point of disobedience. Believe me, I was there. You know, the part of the story I didn't tell you kind of cheers me up. It took me a long time to get over it. Pastor is actually the one. <laughs> I left Pastor Rodney when I should not have. I left him out of disobedience. Didn't do anything wrong. I just went after opportunity that I should not have gone after. And that was my disobedience. And when I talk about grace, one thing you learn, especially working for someone like that, serving someone like that man there's a grace you know when someone runs 15 hours a day 18 hours a day you're running with them you know and there's a grace and if you don't pull and learn how to pull on that grace you'll burn out within seconds you know when you serve someone and you're sick and he's holy good preacher you don't go up to him like man I can't show up to work today I'm sick you know that does not happen you know Hey, we're going to go to three meetings a day and you do all that, you know. There's no excuses. There's no excuses. But there's a grace. And just as you have that grace when you're in the call of God, man, that grace will be go away pretty quick when you're out of the call of God. Especially when you know that you have a call of God on your life and you miss it. You know, we don't tell this a lot, but took me a long time to get over it, man. Probably the last year, I don't know, well, maybe two years ago, you know, just working with Pastor Alex, like, really broke me through on that, you know, blamed myself, you know, guilt, 
guilt for it, you know, thinking that I messed up so bad. It's almost like you felt like you cheated on your wife in a way, you know, it's like you, you can't, can't get over it, you know, like. And obviously, I've talked to Pastor Rodney about all this stuff, you know, and all's good now. But like, man, it doesn't matter what it is. We went back. We made it right. And I mean, since then, it's been the grace is back. You know, you just know. You just know it's back. You know, it's like you think about Jesus, you know, on the cross. When, you know, when his father left him, the presence left him for that moment. You know, I can't imagine what that must feel like. But man, I'm so glad I'm back. So glad I'm back to what God's called me to do. On the last Wednesday that I talked, I kind of mentioned a little bit. Man, I just got it to a point in my life where I've started revealing the gifts that God has in me. It's like, man, I'm so tired of using it for the world, you know? So tired. I want to be effective in the kingdom. And just went to winter camp meeting, booked me an Airbnb. Me alone, didn't care about anyone or anything. Didn't talk to people before service, didn't talk to people after service. I was a man on a mission. Just like I was in South Africa at that time. It's like, man, Lord, it has to change. Something's got to change. I don't care about anything. I don't care about money. I don't care about opportunity. I don't care about living in America. I want to do what you've called me to do. I want to do what you have me to do. I want to be in my treasure want to be in my field and obviously the rest is history Lord told me to lift up Pastor Alex and Pastor Lauren's hands had coffee with him the next week and he was like dude I've known for like a year and a half that you were supposed to be our administrator you know I was like why didn't you tell me man like like no the Lord had to tell you and what an honor it's been to serve this ministry and serve this vision that is so big, you know, like pastor says, can't do it himself. He's called people. You know, me leaving Pastor Rodney and going to South Africa starting to a church was not God. But I think it was a combination of being unschooled, not knowing, and familiarity with his presence. Even when you serve the most biggest generals in the kingdom today, Pastor Rodney, you could still get familiar with everything and not realize what you're doing and what's around you, you know? I was like, man, if I could Benjamin Button it for sure, I would have Pastor Alex before Pastor Rodney, you know? Because the stuff he teaches, you just don't hear it, you know? You just don't. The message that he carries is very, very unique. You know? So don't don't take it lightly. You know, this is the hungry people here tonight. Like the message that he preached is so fundamental for anything that God's called you to do. Like I'm I'm grateful that all that didn't work out because I couldn't imagine going in the ministry without the foundation that he's laying here. And I would have done it myself. That would have been the problem. So that would have been me, myself, and my wife. Where here you truly, truly learn about the kingdom, holding your rank, what God called you to do, holding, you know, in arms together. So even when you mess up, even when you're right in the middle of it, as close as you can be <laughs> to, to that, Man, don't don't take it lightly. So that's kind of my testimony. I hope that helped some of you and some of you that are watching. 
when God's raising up an army, he's doing something. It's like pastor says, the second part of the year is going to be so big. Don't miss out. He's making moves, you know? The enemy made moves the last two years. But he really just made a mistake. That's what he did because he just stirred up us to go take some territory, you know? God's stirring, stirring an anger on the inside of me. It was like my one friend just got pregnant. And they went to, um, maybe some of the girls can help me, the, where they hear the heartbeat and stuff, the clinic, ultrasound. I have two kids and I don't know the name, right? Um, so they go to this place and there's their place and then there's the, the, um, the planning hood, what do they call it? The, um, yeah, that one. Next door. Their building is like super nice. He like sends me a picture like first class. And the one he goes to, which is a place where they do the ultrasound and stuff, but they're also trying to minister to the girls that go there to get abortions, you know? But he's like, man, I am crying walking into this place because why does our place look so crappy and their place look so nice? It's like, this shouldn't be this way. This should be the opposite. This place should be shut down. You know, so we prayed and we're like, man, we curse that place like Jesus curses the fig tree. That every foot that walks in there will turn around. And I truly believe God's going to close that place up, you know. But it's like, man, we need, to, we need to wake up every day with that. You know, our enemy wakes up every day. Like pastor says, hooked up to mammon, hooked up like, hey, how can we destroy life? But we need to wake up every day like, man, how can we preserve life? How can we get to these people that walk in there? You know? So it's like, man, we just on that phone, both just like crying. This was like a week ago. And be like, man, we're going to do everything in business that we could do to like just wreck the system. Just as the system wants to wreck us, we're going to do the opposite to it. And you really don't have to go far to see that. You know, but a lot of times we get so familiar with our life and with everything is good. We don't really care much about what's going outside our four walls and all that. But it's like, man, I would really encourage you, like, and that's really the Lord's been dealing with us, you know, and I, some of the things I want to share, but it's like, man, ask the Lord to, like, show you your place and all that. Like, man, I'm part of a kingdom. What does a kingdom do? A kingdom conquers. Like, where's my part in this kingdom to conquer? Where's my field? Obviously, we're all hooked up to this vision, to what God's doing here, and things are going to explode here, and we're going to go out of here, nations and tribes and all that, you know? But where you are now, like just as the enemy wakes up every morning, like, man, where are we going to destroy life? It's like, man, where's my part? I don't believe God just saves people just to save people. He saves people, equips them, and then sends them out to go do something about it. It's just up to you how far you want to go. Like I said, step by step, puzzle by puzzle. And just comes in spending time with him and his presence. Everyone can just bow their eyes, bow their heads and close their eyes. If maybe here or here tonight. You know, while I was speaking about the call of God, being hungry for the Lord. Maybe that was you at one point, just like me. an unquenched hunger for the Word, the love of God. And 
you're like, man, I've lost that. Lost in life, got busy. Things happen. I love God. I love Him. Love His Word. Love this church. But like I don't have that hunger. Waking up. God, what do you have me to do? Going to bed. Lord, did I do everything today what I was supposed to do? Lord, am I truly doing what you've called me to do? I believe a lot of people know from a young age, just like I did, that there's something different. That God has called you. Maybe even had encounters as a kid. You woke up hearing the nations cry. I believe God wants to restore that tonight for people. It's not about me. Believe me, I don't feel adequate for this job at all. Even this Sunday, I told the Lord, no, it can't be me. Like, I don't, I don't deserve to hold this mic. I believe God wants to restore people in that grace tonight. It's not about me calling you up here, praying for you. The Holy Spirit's so strong here right now. Just talk to Him. Take, take yourself back to that moment. That moment He touched you the first time, that moment you were hungry for Him. I know it's late. I know you want to get out of here. But man, let's just take a few minutes. Let the Lord take you there. He wants to. I knew it.
It's about God, I'll do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes, Lord. I'll be that man and woman you have called me to be. No matter what. Be my hands. Be my feet. Be my mouth. Take my gifts. Take my talents. Everything that I am, Lord, for your kingdom. Every day. Lord, let me not take one step to the left or to the right, but let me keep it on the call of God. The call of God is big. It's very serious. It's holy. It's not a thing to mess with. Believe me, it's not a thing you want to walk away from. You're like, man, I don't feel called in the fivefold ministry. But man, God can call you in your business to be a business owner, to be one of the best managers, to be one of the best salesmen. Best mom that raise up mighty women, women of God. There's no big and small. The way it works in a kingdom is rank, yes. But every role is so important within the kingdom. A kingdom can function if there's not a role. And promotion comes with faithfulness. Being faithful with the little. Being faithful where you at. Promotion comes with relationship. Direction, love, everything comes with relationship. the speed of the Holy Ghost we can do anything we will take over we will walk in favor we will walk in abundance man new level new level this church is going to a whole new level our pastor has gone to a whole new level make sure you don't get left behind the Lord is challenging me personally. I've done some things personally in the last two weeks to like challenge myself. Frustrated where I'm at. I want to do so much more. I mean, like, I just knew, like, I, it starts with me. I can't expect everything around me to level up and change if I don't, right? I mean, I'm tackling every area from the physical, spiritual, educational when pastor said that the end of this year is going to be big I'm grabbing it and I'm going to make sure I'm not going to look back and say I wish I did that or that but I did everything I could to take myself to the next level and I believe by you just being here tonight hungry showing up at a Wednesday not even sure if there was service says something going to be a good here. Bunch of beautiful people. God loves you. Man. give you a chance, an opportunity to give.
also on the division. Wednesday night is our our building offering. We are expanding quickly. We are um, busy with the plans and the surveys for the new sanctuary that we're going to build right behind here. It's going to be a big cedar. Um, so keep us in prayer for that. Men's bathrooms are about done. I know Jesse's working on some amazing artwork for you boys. And uh, Mr. Ricardo and uh, everyone calls him Pastor's dad. I call him Tio. And Mr. Sam and Charlie, the whole team is working hard and getting all of it done and connected. And uh, yeah, a lot of things in the works. Coffee cart, some good coffee, and uh, more kids' events. We're going to do a lot more kids' events, which is going to be pretty exciting. And man, once all the legal stuff's out of the way, we'll go full thrust, jet engines. Mach 10, like Tom Cruise, and there's no looking back, you know. And man, we're gonna need, we're gonna need help. We're gonna need leaders. We need people. And we know God's raising up some amazing people in the church. We can give by cash app. I think all of you know this. For those watching, River Orlando Church. Tidely Riverlander Church. You can give online slash donate. Uh, it's also you can give with crypto if you just had a big one on XRP, um, and then check or credit card. They're handing out the envelopes, and then uh, let's put up those confessions. So we're in covenant with God, you know. Say I'm in covenant with God with my finances. I worship God with my giving. God gives me seed so I can multiply. I worship the Lord with my giving. And that's just not something that Pastor wanted to throw up there. Like, I am a testimony. I think we changed it two times. He really thought that true. It's not just something he put up. So that really comes from his spirit, you know? So don't Man, mean it. A lot of people in a lot of churches just have a little bucket out by the exit, throw in a tinkle. But it's a holy thing, man. Like, just like the altar call on Sundays. If you were here Sunday, who was, who, who was not here Sunday? Sunday's altar call was powerful. Man, and there was people's dads, you know. I know, like, Caleb would mind me saying this, but his dad was up there, man. His dad got wrecked. I got wrecked just looking at Caleb getting wrecked, you know, because I know, like, I love my dad, so I'm just imagining that's my dad. I remember when we did meetings in South Africa, and, man, just pressing him for my dad to get touched, you know, and Pastor Rodney did a meeting in Johannesburg, and I was busy getting the crowds together. It was a massive altar call, and Pastor Donica sends me a picture of my dad and the altar call, you know? Even though my dad was saved, he loved the Lord, but, like, I just knew, like, Pastor Rodney's altar call is different. <laughs> and I was, I was a wreck. I couldn't even, like, function. Because I just, I was, you know, as a son, I mean, there's nothing more you want but your parents to have what you're experiencing, you know? And maybe you have loved ones right now that you want them to experience what you have. Man, let me tell you that God is faithful. You know, when I left, part of my testimony you can say was like, God, I'm losing years with my family. You know, because everyone stayed. Like 12 years now that I've lost with my parents, seeing them twice a year. But very early on, on the carpet, in a youth service. I don't think it was, I think it was still cement back then, right, Pastor Brett? And the, you know, it was cement, on the cement. The Lord told me that everything that you have sacrificed, I will redeem it to you. 
And I know the time will come. They'll move here. I'm not going to pressure them, but I know the Lord will redeem that. And then when you get an eternal perspective about everything, even if I don't in this life, I know I'll see them in heaven. Eternity, man, is a long time. When you think about everything eternally, maybe one day I can share on that, but working with Pastor Rodney, you really get an eternal expert perspective. Man, for like nursing home, going to a nursing home with him is quite different. You really get an eternal, where just things of this world just don't matter. Because in the time, space, capsule, it's so small, but it's so important what we do here. But, back to my original thought, didn't forget. The altar call, man, is holy. Do never take it for light. Do never walk around. Do never go to the bathroom during the altar call, during the offering. It's holy. It's holy in the Old Testament. It's holy in the New Testament. We're worshiping God. Some people are giving big things during an offering. You don't know. Some people are giving their most valuable alabaster box. You don't know. It's no different than someone's dad coming to the altar call and getting saved and touched for the first time while a family member has been praying years, months, whatever it is, for that person to get saved and touched. It's no different. We treat those things as holy and we respect them. That's why we're very strict with our serve team, ushers and security. We're very, very zero tolerance with offerings and things like that when people get prayed for and people are on the ground because man we're ushering the anointing making room for the Lord to move guys we're at a good time good place you might be looking into your circumstances right now and be like, what the is this African-American talking about? Yeah, I'm African-American. I'm white. But I am. Just by being in this church, man, is special. Stick around. Stay hungry. I'm telling you. From a guy that had massive guilt looked like they had everything together but felt like there was no way to redeem the call of God in my life to do what God's called me to do after I left one of the most important assignments I felt like the Lord's ever given me it was a journey but he totally set me free and then the next assignment came even though I couldn't go back to the last assignment, but I got redeemed. That's just how much God loves us, man. Can I hand out the buckets? Thanks, John. Lord, thank you for the service, Lord. Thank you for your word. Father, thank you for this week. Thank you that we can go out of here, Lord. That this week's going to be a powerful week. Thank you for being with our pastors where they are. Serving with Kids Week and Youth Week. Thank you for touching all the youth and the kids. Especially the ones from this church, Lord. <laughs> They're our favorites. 
Father, touch him, change him. Let him come back on fire with a new hunger for you, Lord. That they would come and stir up some of our adults, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that our kids, you're raising them up to be mighty men and women of God. Thank you, Father, that we are so grateful that we can give them at a young age what we never experienced, Lord. Oh, Lord, if I am thankful and if I praise you for something, Lord, it's that. That I can give my kids what took me years to experience. We thank you, Lord. Father, thank you for bringing the right people to this church, even the Sunday, Lord, bringing the lost, the broken, the sick. So, Lord, they come and experience your presence. Thank you for everyone here tonight, Father. Lord, that they would experience your presence anew, that they would hear the call anew, Lord. A new hunger will be stirred up for the things of God. And, Father, we'll go out of this place and it will be not just a nice sermon or something that I just spoke but we would truly go make an impact Father every day wherever we are use us, be our hands, be our feet be our lips Lord, guide our heart step by step Lord guide us through this puzzle of life Father that you have called us to do, that each person here will find their field and their treasure Lord bless our pastors Lord, we honor them Thank you for bringing everything to pass that they're believing for. Thank you, Lord, that we can do whatever we can to serve this church, serve the vision. And Father, at the end, we'll all celebrate with you, Lord, and hear the words, good and faithful servant. And to that, the joy of the Lord. Holy Spirit, we love you. 